thank you, Hamish. My name is Avi Miller. Uh, to give you guys a bit of background, I have nothing to do with Asterix. I have nothing to do with Trixbox. There is a small piece of my code still left in free PBX, but that's about it. Uh, my history with Asterix is as a user and setting it up for uh, an Australian open source company. So I've uh, had the history of the past sort of three years of working with Asterix uh, back in the 1.0 days uh, and then right now with Asterix 1.4 which is in this and uh, we can talk a little bit about Asterix 1.6. For those of you, just to give you an idea what this tutorial is designed for, if you have worked with Asterix, you've played with it, you've got it running, this is not the tutorial for you. Okay, this is a beginner. I've never seen it. I just want a VoIP system for home. I think it's cool. I'm going to play with it. We're going to go from the very basics of setting up uh, a Trixbox appliance, uh, getting extensions talking to each other, so routing, using the features, getting into trunking, uh, so which means getting two Asterix boxes and more to talk to each other, and then going into some of the uh, quite nifty uh, sort of business features, so IVRs and voicemail following and follow me and find you and caller ID integration and that kind of stuff. Okay. So that is the uh, URL, but you might have noticed that, that everybody hammering my poor web server is <laughs> signed to the download. A warning about this ISO, don't burn it and boot from it, it will erase your machine. It's a completely destructive installer with no questions asked. So, um, if you did that, woo! Um, but it is designed, <laughs> you're not going to admit it now, but um, it is designed uh, in this session to run in a VM. What I've got on the board is I'm going to uh, kind of restrict the trunking session of this to five additional servers in the room. Uh, if we all try to trunk the VMs that we've got, uh, we're going to kill the AP, first of all. Uh, but it's just going to make routing, setting up all the routes uh, in the GUI a little bit tedious. What I will talk about is what happens when you do need to start trunking lots and lots of asterisk boxes. And we'll talk about Dundee later. Okay. So first of all, who is going to run an asterisk VM? Wow, a bunch of you. Okay. So what I'm going to do is pick a few. And I'm going to need your IP addresses. Somebody in the middle? Stick your hand up. Uh, can you guys all grab your IP addresses for me? Uh, we'll make a note once your Trixbox appliances come up what IP address they get because they'll be running DHCP. So, okay. You'll also be happy to know this is the only slide in the entire tutorial. Okay. I spent minutes agonizing over this, um, but I decided that everything is going to be live um, in the GUIs in SSH. Uh, I also want to thank, by the way, Finality for giving me a Trixbox appliance for today's presentation. So that was kindly donated by them. Yes. When you are uh, choosing your distro, uh, Red Hat Enterprise 5 32-bit is the base, it's actually CentOS underneath, so Red Hat 5 32-bit is what we're using. And for those of you who are using VMware Fusion, don't turn on easy install. The rest of the settings, uh, what I would need you guys to do is shift um, networking away from NAT and onto bridged. We will talk about netting when we get to the extensions and how you guys use uh, extensions that are not on your network or connecting to asterisk boxes that are not on your network. Okay, and you will note, this will format your hard drive and just destroy all the data. It is merciless. Okay, there are a couple of options. Uh, in the installer that if you want to set up uh, soft RAID, so uh, RAID 1, there are installer options you're not going to do in your VM because it kills having shared storage on a VM, but if you do it in real life. Uh, the nice thing about the appliance, if you guys are thinking about appliances, when you boot this and you give an appliance tag, it actually sets up the appliance automatically with RAID 1. 
uh, on the hard drives because there are two of them in there. Note as well, Trixbox are now quite uh, honest about the fact that there's a heartbeat inside Trixbox that pings Finality servers once a day. You can turn this off, okay? but there is a heartbeat that keeps um, Trixbox up to date as well. Okay, so anybody here used Asterix, played with uh, Asterix on any? Wow, okay. I'll give you a bit of history, um, just of my use of Asterix, so it's not a history of Asterix itself. Um, but when I started uh, Asterix, there were no uh, mature configuration tools for Asterix at that time. So Asterix 1.0 will look at the configuration files. They haven't actually changed that much since that day, but you had to hand code them. So just to configure a single extension in the dial plan would take about five or six lines if you wanted voicemail and other fun things. So actually writing one for, you know, 100 people in a company is a very, very long, tedious, cut-and-paste, error-prone process. So, uh, with the advent of FreePBX, which was one of the first uh, PHP GUI tools for configuring Asterix, it actually became useful uh, because FreePBX would handle all of the really tedious uh, Asterix configuration file creation for you. Then they started building um, appliance style ISOs, if you like, so distro style ISOs. Uh, UTC option, by the way, is, is personal preference. There's no requirement in Asterix to abuse UTC. Uh, it is useful, however, if you've got lots of Asterix boxes and you have NTP internally and stuff like that. So. Secret password. Yes. Okay, so that would now hopefully run away. Um, so a bunch of, of kind of asterisk distributions uh, started getting built. Um, the first one that I started playing with is something called Asterix at Home, uh, which is a fantastic example, by the way, of bloatware. Uh, for those of you who ever saw Asterix at home, it started off great. Oh, this is amazing. I've got a distro that actually configures Asterix with all of its dependencies. And it worked after install. And then they decided, ah, oh, I can add a GUI configurating tool. Great. Then I can add a CRM, a CRM package for no readily apparent reason. And they just started adding more and more software into this thing until it was about a DVD's worth. Instead of quite a lean 400 meg ISO, it became something like a 3 gig ISO of, not to put too fine a point on it, crap. I mean, most of the stuff actually started slowing the asterisk process on these boxes down quite heavily. Um, so out of that, a bunch of people decided, hey, we can do this better. They created new distributions. Elastix uh, is quite popular these days as well as an Asterix respin. Uh, Elastix has its own GUI configuration tool. Um, so it does embed free PBX, so we see the same under the hood stuff, but it's a different wrapper, if you like. But Elastix is kind of going the same way as Asterix at Home did. They're starting to add Jabba servers and CRM products and webmail and all that kind of stuff into this product, which... In my opinion, you might differ, but in my opinion, it doesn't actually belong on your phone server. Okay. Uh, PBX in a flash, another one I haven't played with it yet, uh, comes out of the guys that do nerd vittles. For those of you who blog and read nerd vittles, some really lovely, <coughs> excuse me, really lovely asterisk mini scripts, if you like. So um, how to get uh, weather talking to you, you know, the dial weather kind of stuff. So they've got these little snippets of dial plan. Uh, options, and then they created PBX in a flash that allows you to sort of really easily incorporate these nerd vittle scripts, weather and, and wake up calls and stuff like that. Okay. There are options to Asterix. If you don't want to use Asterix, is the oldest of the open source IP telephony solutions, but there are options. There's Call Weaver, which was forked from the Asterix code a while. Uh, the guys who write Asterix, uh, Asterix uh, who are Digium, have quite strong. Uh, copyright requirements for code into the core of Asterix, they require you to, to assign copyright to Digium because Digium dual license Asterix, a lot like MySQL does. Um, so there's the Asterix open source edition and the Asterix business edition. So a lot of the developers who are working on Asterix said we don't want to sign over our copyright and they forked it off and created Call Weaver. There's FreeSwitch, which I'm told is really cool but I haven't played with it yet. Uh, I've kind of been focusing on making sure my Asterix boxes don't die. 
Asterix to, to give you a, a, the mindset you should be taking into with any telephony system is you don't upgrade it. Once you've got a working install of an Asterix system, you leave it alone because it's your phones, particularly in business. These things, you know, if, you, if you're supporting your help desks or you're supporting your tech support or sales guys, your sales guys are not going to wait for eight hours while you decide to upgrade the kernel of your phone system. Okay. <laughs> A pretty quick install process. Anybody else finished their install yet? <laughs> yes, sorry, yeah, we are hammering the poor IP. <laughs> there are USB keys floating around as well if you want to grab it off a USB key. Okay. Yes. The nice thing about these kinds of distributions is they build in, uh, you can see, just quickly here, we'll go over it a little later. They build in drivers for some of the more popular hardware devices for Asterix. Uh, this uh, appliance has a Sangoma PSTN adapter in it, so it's got um, two analog phone ports that are available. Uh, Digium themselves actually sell hardware as well as you know, selling Asterix Business Edition. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Digium's hardware. Um, their original analog boards were pretty shit. Their ISDN boards are great. Their echo cancellers are awesome. Uh, Sangoma boards for ISDN. I've always used Sangoma boards for ISDN. Um, they throw far fewer interrupts when they're doing real-time media than the, um, than the, Digi the Digium boards do. So if you have a fairly low-powered server, you sort of, somebody's donated, here's my Pentium 2. Um, the Digium boards would just overrun the, the interrupt requests on those things and you just crash. So. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're part of the Zaptel package, which is distributed GPL from. Uh, in fact, I think Zaptel's LGPL. Yeah. They're just not in the kernel. Yes. The, this is the Digium drivers are included here, which is the Sangoma ones are not GPL. You're right. But they're more reliable and more stable. Um, <clears throat> I think the last time I bought a Sangoma card, the ISDN, the, the uh, primary rate ISDN cards were about 700 bucks with no echo cans. With echo cans or without? <laughs> That's not bad. Okay. Yep. Uh, the, the most expensive cards that we ever bought, uh, which I still love, are the Icon Diva basic rate ISDN cards. We, we were running for a while, instead of going to primary rate, we were running sort of two to four uh, basic rate ISDNs. And those Icon Diva cards were unreal. Just beautiful, beautiful cards, rock solid. And they could do uh, fax on board. So all the fax handling was done by the Icons directly. Uh, and they can do conferencing on board. So we were doing uh, Meet Me conferences with Asterix. Asterix is doing all the transcoding between uh, all the callers. With the icon cards, all the inbound ISDNs were actually muxed before they went to Asterix. So Asterix didn't have to handle eight inbound, uncompressed audio streams. Okay. Now the, the first boot is longer than the install itself. Come on. Okay. So to give you an idea, just from a Trixbox point, a Trixbox point of view, it is uh, Asterix 1.4. Uh, with all the, the related uh, Zaptel and primary rate ISDN drivers that go with that. It is, uh, MySQL is running, and MySQL stores your configuration. Uh, FreePBX is the uh, main graphical uh, configuration tool that we use. It's wrapped by Trixbox's somewhat garishly green interface. But, um, and then what, Trix, uh, what FreePBX actually does is, um, when you're changing settings inside the GUI, it's recording, to, recording them to, or saving them in MySQL, it doesn't change your running asterisk config until you apply. What happens then is it sucks all the config out of MySQL and writes all of asterisk configuration files. So if you break the script that does that, <laughs> uh, you will break your asterisk box. Um, so that, what I actually usually caution people against, if you're going with a distribution style for asterisk, so you're actually going to pick Trixbox or Elastix or one of those things, don't mess with their internal scripts because they have fairly horrible dependencies on one another. 
I mean, they're built not to be changed. If you're going to build your own Asterix box, uh, I personally recommend using CentOS as a base. And at RPMs.net has some really nice Asterix packages. Um, and their repository is, is fairly sane. So if you, if you do a yum install Asterix off at RPMs, it'll pull down all of the Zaptel modules, the kernel modules for Zaptel as well, uh, all the fun stuff for that. I haven't found an RPM package for free PBX yet. So on a standalone box, I always just drag that off SourceForge. And it's a PHP app, so it's not that difficult to install manually. Come on. The AP could be having a hard time. Remember that VMware Fusion sometimes won't give uh, a bridged IP address to uh, wireless devices. Cool. Is anybody still downloading off my server? How many guys are still downloading off my server? Do you guys want to stop your download and we'll give you a USB key in a couple of minutes? Just so we can bring the network back up. Thank you very much. Okay. I will go through while I'm still waiting for my, uh, my boot. It was faster when I did this, obviously. Uh, mine, mine's booted through that already, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Awesome. I think it's probably because my machine is so busy handing out. <laughs> Uh, I stat menus. If all else fails, I'll switch to the appliance, which I know is running. Let's do that. Okay. I suspect it's possibly doing the initial phone home at that stage, or trying to, perhaps. That's what you'll get. Sorry, that's what you'll get uh, once Trixbox boots. It'll tell you what its IP address is. Um, if you hit that IP address, you get the slightly green uh, Trixbox interface. This is the user mode. So if you're provisioning Trixbox for a small office where you have users besides yourself. They'll have things like web access to voicemail and their phone recordings if you choose to record uh, telephone calls. A note that in Australia, you're not allowed to record a telephone call without the permission of both sides of the call. So the person who's phoning you or the person you are phoning has to agree to be recorded before, you're allowed to, before you are legally allowed to record that call. What you choose to do is up to you. Just making you aware of that fact. Web Meet Me, I have uh, yet to see the real point of, because I don't do a lot of uh, online conferencing. But what it is, is an application that allows users to set up their own web, uh, their own phone conferences. So those of you who use sort of Cisco uh, uh, conferencing, you get a, an admin pin, and you get a user pin, and people have to sign up, and you can control and mute and do all that kind of stuff. It's the same deal, just for Asterix. Uh, and FUP which is an unfortunate ac acronym, is the Flash Operator Panel. Uh, it is a Flash app that shows you the status of your Asterix box. And the nice thing is that Trixbox keeps the um, FOP configuration up to date. So as you add extensions and add trunks, it will update that in the FOP. I find the FOP really difficult to work with, though. If you actually want to do uh, receptionist-based style, you know, transfer people and answer calls and things, there is another one that we'll look at built into Trixbox called HUD Lite that is a Windows and Mac app at this point, but it actually gives you an on-desktop control, so something far more useful for receptionists who have a lot of extensions to deal with. Bugger. OK, so the first thing we want to do at this point is switch into uh, admin mode, and it's going to ask you for a username and password. The defaults for this.
is meant so meant and password I will, I will ask, of course, once we get IP addresses up on the board, hopefully, please don't go and reconfigure somebody else's asterisk box. Uh, a bit of a trust system here. Okay, so this is my appliance that's running, so it is slightly configured. I decided to not tempt fate completely by coming in with nothing configured and working, so I know the appliance at least works. Um, so this is showing me a, a view of the status of my system. You can see all of the services running. On the left, I've gotten to the point of actually configuring HUD, so my HUD server is running, whereas in a standard install, your HUD server should probably be stopped at this stage. Some device information over in the corner here. I've got some asterisk-specific information, how many channels are active, how many current registrations I have, which is devices connected to the box, uh, how many peers I have. Uh, in this case, I have uh, I use SIP to trunk to other uh, IP providers, so I'm actually connected to uh, node phones, uh, internodes, VoIP service on the appliance. So, yes, once we start routing again, I'm going to shut down external access because you don't really I don't want you running up my node phone bill with calls to your mother in Turkey or something. Okay. But it's pretty nifty. It's a great way of... I, also, by the way, this thing keeps refreshing, so don't leave the screen open. <laughs> it keeps hammering the server to find out what its stats are. Okay. The packages option seems to be a bit iffy at the moment. The first time you hit it, it actually tries to do a yum update in the background because it's trying to get a package list off the repos. So I usually recommend... Uh, getting into SSH, doing a YUM update first in the console, so everything's pretty much up to date. YUM update, now for those of you who did play with Trixbox before, YUM update was always a, a, a roll of the dice as to whether your appliance would, or your asterisk would restart after a YUM update. Uh, they're much better at it now. Uh, I think I haven't had a, uh, a Trixbox go down after a YUM update for a while, which is pretty good. They were hideous about this you know, earlier, before the 2.4 days or 2.5 days of Trixbox, a YUM update was almost certainly guaranteed to brick your machine. So. so here we have the PBX menu. This is where you do most of your work. And this is where we'll do most of our work today. Move that. There we go. Uh, the PBX settings actually fires up an embedded uh, copy of free PBX. So all of these distributions tend to use the same real GUI underneath, which is free PBX. So if you are building your own Asterix box, you don't want uh, the wrapper that Trixbox or Elastix provides. I always recommend using free PBX because it writes all of the really tedious code, all the voicemail handling code, all of the internal routing code for you. The config file editor. So if you really hate SSH, uh, you can actually edit the config files from inside the, the web tool. Gizmo integration. I'm not a huge Gizmo fan, but if you've got a Gizmo account, you can link between Trixbox and Gizmo, and then route calls to Gizmo. PBX status, which is a far more um, low-impact view of how your PBX is looking at the moment, how long you've been up. Nine hours is... Um, Probably interesting, considering this appliance was only started after lunch. Oh well. We've got um, just a view of what I've got. I've got two uh, active channels that are actually dead because they're node phone ones. I have to clean this up. Some uh, SIP connections into node phone under the SIP registry. Some SIP peers. Again, the node phones and my extension is up. The Linksys IP phone is connected. Again, I didn't want to come here completely unconfigured, so the phone, the appliance, and the connection to Node Phone are all working as of lunchtime. <laughs> I made a call. I know it works. Okay. And there's a bunch of other stuff we'll go through, which will start to make more sense as we go through the configuration of Asterix itself. Okay. I think something's broken. Ooh. I just want to try rebooting this again so I start with a blank system like you guys are going to start with. Um, 
No, this is the appliance. I'm sorry, the, the web GUI that I'm looking at at the moment is the, is, is the appliance, not the VM that I'm running. So the VM's still trying to boot. What does the uptime say on the front? One hour. Okay, so it's, it probably is because I have UTC for that as well, and it's showing me uh, UTC count. Sloppy PHP coding somewhere that's not doing a decent time zone <coughs> conversion. At least, if, at least I found an IP address. Ha <laughs> ha. Yes, I am. I know I've locked my Fusion to just the wired connection, so it doesn't bridge against Wi-Fi at all. Either way, it'll get an IP address. Should do. <laughs> what we can do later, guys, is just hook your um, wired connections up to the internal network of the appliance. The appliance is running DHCP, which is why it has to have a separate network, because Steve would kill me if I turn the DHCP server on on the main network. It could be quite fun to see how long it takes him to get here, though. <laughs> it should hopefully not be me. Wow, this is taking too long. I'll switch to this one. Okay, so if I go into PBX settings, this is the um, free PBX default. You'll notice that a lot of this stuff is duplicated because free PBX is actually designed to be standalone. It's, it's being wrapped by Trixbox. But what you see underneath the menu of the, the sort of underneath the Trixbox main menu is actually free PBX itself. Um, so it's actually quite a good manager tool uh, if you want to create uh, some fairly lean asterisk boxes, get a CentOS base, asterisk RPMs, Debian base, and, and asterisk Debs, and then just shove free PBX on top of it. So I'm seeing the same kind of, you'll notice as well that it's doing live updates against the network and against uh, memory, so it is also pinging the server fairly rapidly. You'll see it complaining about the default SQL password and the default Asterix Manager password being used. Trixbox uses them during its install. I highly recommend that you change them. Okay, and changing them is a bit of an involved process. Trixbox sadly does not make it easy for you to do this. Can you guys read that? Can you read that? No? It doesn't have bold on Monica. It does have bold. Cool. Okay. I'll first show you the um, the help tricks box gives you this option to uh, change your configuration of your network to switch from DHCP to fixed IP addresses, which is highly recommended if you're going to start trying to do NAT. So if you want um, external extensions or external um, other asterisk boxes to link to, you have to start setting up NAT, and for that purpose, you really want to know the IP address of your asterisk box at all times. Password mint to try and to change that mint password for the web GUI. Again, you should do that. Change the uh, root password is always just password if you're logged in as root. 
There's a whole bunch of setup scripts to set up oil provisioning for various phone types. Uh, the setup DHCP is the prep to uh, install and set up the DHCP server. Set up Samba, um, so you can share files. I strongly, strongly recommend against putting Samba on your asterisk box. Uh, you shouldn't be using it as a file server. Heavy I.O. is going to nail your IP conversations. If you have more than about three or four conversations going at once, then you decide to uh, download a, a large file of your Samba share, you're going to negatively impact um, your IP calls. Configure said mail for mail. You always just want out. This is for outbound mail. Remember, the Trixbox sends a lot of mail-based notifications. If you, have a v uh, if you get a voicemail, it's going to send you an email notifying you've got a voicemail. You can configure it to actually send you the voicemail as well. So you can email delivery of voicemails. Set up PSTN to detect and set up supported uh, interface cards. This only works with the Digium cards, by the way, automatically. It's not going to detect the Sangoma card. You actually have to go to the Sangoma website and download their Trixbox RPMs and install those. Okay. Install HUD Lite, uh, which is, I'll show you HUD Lite. It's running on the appliance. It's a really nice Windows and Mac OS X based uh, almost console. Shows you all the extensions, who's on the phone, allows you to transfer calls and put people on hold and pretend you have a headset and stuff like that. Okay. Install Postfix instead of SendMail. Those two last ones just flip between Postfix and SendMail. You'll notice, however, there is no option for change default passwords as I'm being bitched at by FreePBX. That is unfortunately a manual thing. So, so the default SQL, SQL password that is widely known. Two things. I'm not going to do this because it's, it's tedious. I'll show you where uh, I'm not going to change the MySQL password because that's a standard go into MySQL and change MySQL's password. For those of you who don't know, there's a magnificent tool called Google that will tell you exactly how to do that. What I will show you is how to change it inside um, Asterix. Uh, in ETC AM portal. Okay. This is the configuration file for most of the work, or for most of the um, Trixbox, uh, sorry, free PBX configuration. So this is where the PHP application pulls all of its settings from. So you notice the engine's MySQL, the password by default is AMP109. Okay. So that's the one you have to change. You have to go in and change the Asterix user. The DB user by default is called Asterix user in MySQL. You have to go into MySQL's privileges table. So PHP my admin or use the MySQL tool, go and change its password, come in here, change the password, the AMP DB pass. However, there's a gotcha. It's never that easy. Trixbox, instead of uncommenting these lines, goes and puts all of its configuration right at the end of the file. So right at the end of this file is actually all the uncommented versions of these. That, that took me hours at midnight. <laughs> I'm changing the password. It's not working. Presumably, I haven't tested that theory. All the rest, all the, act, all the stuff above it is actually commented. Yes. You end up with the lower one, absolutely. Yes. And notice the Trixbox will rewrite this on upgrade. So if you are going to do YUM upgrades, this file does tend to get rewritten periodically. So you want to check that after a yum upgrade that amportal.conf hasn't gone and died on you. Okay. The next thing that you have to change Oops. The other thing it, config, uh, it complains about is the Asterix manager password. Uh, Asterix has a management interface uh, that you can use to communicate between external scripts and Asterix, a running Asterix. <coughs> and by default, uh, Trixbox uses the standard management password. So we have to change it in two places. Again, somewhere. There we go. To keep us on our toes, it's not at the bottom of everything else. <laughs> it's uncommented high up in the uh, in the configuration file. AMP manager pass is AMP 111. 
And that tells Trixbox what to use. We have to tell Asterix what to use as well. If you want to do it the Trixbox way, you can go into the config file editor. Find manager.conf. You'll see the secret there is amp111. The nice thing about the uh, security settings is that they actually take effect immediately. So as soon as you save this file, Asterix will accept connections on the management interface with the password that you provide. So I can actually change this one and get rid of that message fairly easily. I've actually noticed now this, is a, this will be an interesting one. I've changed the password for Asterix, but not free PBX yet. And it goes away somewhere. It should stop allowing me to make. You'll notice on the left, things have gone black, extensions and blacklists. I can't communicate with Asterix anymore, so it's disabled my viewing and editing of those options. Okay. Now that I have fixed the password, things like extensions and blacklists come back because now I can communicate with Asterix again. It's good. The other thing you'll notice, by the way, is that the warning went away. As soon as it noticed it wasn't using its default password anymore, it actually took my warning away, which is quite nifty. And if you want to take the warning away without actually fixing the problem. <laughs> There's a little no entry sign on the right that will do it for you. Okay, so let's work down on the left. The first thing is the module admin. Unfortunately, FreePBX's modules that it uses for its own configuration are actually separate from Trixbox's own uh, internal software repository. So you manage the modules for Trixbox separately. It'll show you all the modules that are installed and enabled. If you want to simplify your PBX, you can actually go and disable some of these modules. And you can turn off various features just by disabling the modules. And then that configuration snippet re gets removed from the GUI. Okay. Now, please do not do this in the classroom because we're hammering the AP already. But if you check for updates online, Trixbox connects to SourceForge and gets the latest uh, list of available modules from SourceForge. Okay. And what it will show you if there are any available modules things like PHP IG config is available, I can download and install it. For those of you who freshly installed, there are a bunch of modules that are now updated. Uh, I do ask you don't upgrade them now. Um, the modules that you've got will work. <laughs> Okay. But it's good to periodically check this for additional features um, because the free PBX team will add additional modules to the, uh, to the base package uh, online on SourceForge and you come back and oh, I can now, there is in fact a, um, anybody here plays Zork back in the day? You have to show your age if you did, but there is a text-to-speech version of Zork that is available for Asterix. So not only does text-to-speech of the Zork, it does speech-to-text recognition of your voice. So you play it by saying, go east. And it's actually though, quite a fun demo of um, Sepstral, uh, the um, text-to-speech engine, and Sphinx, which is the speech-to-text engine. And it will allow you and sort of uh, demo for you the ability for you to create annoying IVRs like large companies have. But you can, I want, bang, you know? You can actually do that with Asterix to varying degrees of success based on the connection type to your Asterix server. From an admin point of view, the um, built-in Trixbox doesn't use authentication for free PBX because it has that web-based password, which is super secure. Um, 
You can then again add administrators to FreePBX and switch the auth type in that ampportal.conf uh, to database. It will then use uh, users actually configured inside the, the MySQL database for authentication to FreePBX as well. So you start getting a web-based login. Over all of this, if you're actually going to have these things running and connected to the internet, I would suggest you get an SSA, uh, SSL certificate and shove the entire thing into, into HTTPS. It survives quite nicely with a mod rewrite rule for any, any request coming in on HTTP. Just rewrite the whole thing to HTTPS. Okay. If you're using it at home, I would, again, this is why I recommend it having as a separate machine. Just put it in the corner and wrap lots of firewalls around it. Okay. Whoops. Okay, so we're going to start with extensions. Okay, extensions are used to connect phone and phone-like devices to your Asterix box. Okay, this is a Linksys IP phone, quite a nifty one, about 180 bucks if you're looking for a nifty IP phone, I recommend it. Um, you could be connecting things like an ATA, IP to analog uh, telephony adapter. So here I've got my very lovely analog phone connected via the ATA. Now, this isn't actually configured yet, so let's go and do that. It is a SIP device. Asterix supports two major IP protocols. SIP, or session, is session initialization protocol, is in fact just an invitational protocol. It tells uh, the two SIP devices, hi, I want to call you, hi, I want to call. It doesn't actually transfer media. Media gets handed over to RTP. Okay. So RTP is standard used by lots of media players to, to pass audio and video. So all SIP does is session initialization. It says, I'm calling. Are you authenticated? Yes, you are. What codec do you want to use? I don't have that. And then fall over. Okay. The biggest, biggest point of troubleshooting any asterisk, when you get calls, you see everything happen and the call just hangs up, it's almost always a codec issue. The two ends are not a, the, the two sides that are trying to call each other are not able to agree on a compatible codec between the two of them, so they drop the call. Okay. So let's set up that ATA. It's a bit tough. Oh, you can see the I can't see the boxes on my screen, but you can actually see them on the projector for a change. Okay, give it an extension. This is the number you call on the PBX to get to that phone. Based on the numbering, I've pulled the 100 range, so 100 to 199 when we get to routing for my appliance. The 200 range eventually might be my VM if I ever get it started up. Pick, a word of advice if you try to do this for your company, you're going to start deploying asterisks and you think, oh, I have all these offices. Pick your numbering plan up front and consider that your company is going to get about 10 times bigger when you do it. Okay, because the last thing you want is to get stuck into a numbering plan that only allows you 99 extensions in one location, and you then get 100 people. Because then somebody complains they don't have a phone. Okay, especially once you run out, if you're going to use three-digit extension codes and you've got nine offices, works fine. <laughs> if you have three-digit extension codes and you get a tenth office that has 100 people, you're screwed. And renumbering everything is tedious. It's not that difficult, you, but you have to go out, export all the extensions, renumber them, and teach people what their new phone number is. Uh, my advice, and those of you who are going to go with ISDN, ISDN has a very, very, very lovely service called uh, Dial-in Rangers. So you get 100 numbers associated with your ISDN service, regardless of how many actual channels you have. And it means those 100 numbers are associated. And as the call comes in, asterisk, Asterix knows what number was called to get to your ISDN service, and you can route based on that. <coughs> based on the size of the company, you would get numbers from your ISDN provider. Here in Hobart, for example, so you want 100 range, you get from 000 to 999. You can get up to that number would. Sorry. Like that, for example. So from 00, zero to 99 in the range. And if you, are, if you are thinking of expansion, you can actually ask your ISDN provider for multiple contiguous 100 number ranges. And then create, exchange, uh, create extensions that use all four of the final digits. People find it a hell of a lot easier to remember their phone number 
when the extension is the end of the phone number. Makes sense. Okay, so what have we got? My extension is 102. I don't think this room's going to get much bigger now, so I'm happy with that numbering plan. The display name will show up on compatible devices. So whatever I set for the display name of this device, when it calls this device, I will see that on the device. Okay. So good to put people's names in there so they can see who's calling. Uh, when I started this, um, when I, I did uh, Squiz's first Asterisk deployment, I thought, uh, you know, display name, I'll put in the name of the type of phone. So everybody in the company was Polycom IP501, which made screening your calls really difficult. Okay. <laughs> but I don't learn. Uh, CID number alias. The nice thing again about free PBX, if you hover over the fields, it actually tells you what things are. So the CID number is used for internal calls. So you can have uh, a caller ID used internally as opposed to externally. Great for people who monitor other people's calls. So you can create an extension for a secretary that is able to dial out as if she was someone else, like a boss. Okay. Which is pretty cool. We have a SIP alias, which allows you to set up an uh, alphanumeric uh, setup of uh, calls. So you can phone, you can do SIP to SIP calling of these extensions. They actually respond to IP address slap, slash SIP identifier, and it'll route out to the phone. I haven't used them. Direct DID is where you have some fun or direct inward dial, it is uh, redundant. It's direct, direct inward dial if you expand the, uh, <laughs> the acronym. This is where you put the full 10 digit DID that gets provided by your ISDN provider. Okay. Or if you have an IP provider that gives you a, a number range as well, pretty nifty. It is also, <coughs> if you put it in here to the extension, FreePBX automatically sets inbound routes for that number for you. It never used to do this. So you would have to go and manually set up inbound routes for all of these direct numbers. Uh, nowadays, and, and that's where my code is in FreePBX, is uh, the direct DID stuff on the extension. You type in a number. <coughs> and if Asterix receives a call for that number, it will automatically get routed to this extension. So direct inward dialing, makes sense. Really easy to configure now. <coughs> alert information, alert information is an additional header inside the SIP uh, startup that allows you to send alerts to the phone or device that you're calling. Particularly useful on things like the Linksys and the Polycom phones that can do things like auto answer or change their ring. So you can highlight different call types using alert info. So I can have an alert info of direct, and then in the Polycom configuration, go in and say, if I have a norm, the default ring type is this. If I get an alert info of direct, I change the ring style. Okay. There is, uh, I don't know how much of this left-hand side we're going to get through, by the way, in the time we've got now. So those of you who are following along, by the way, let's set up some extension ranges. Did, did anybody get an IP address? Nobody got an IP address. Did anybody, does anybody do this not on a Mac? Or you'll have VMware Fusion's no IP address. Not a Mac, not, but no IP address? Do you have an IP address? <laughs> when Steam arrives, it's him. Save yourselves. <laughs> um, Okay, we might do routing between the appliance and my VM if it ever boots. Yes, which way the connection is going? Yeah, it should work. We can, yeah, we could at least get calls in uh, in one direction without uh, more configuration. We probably wouldn't get audio between them. Uh, audio is the big thing for NAT. Getting SIP to work is easy. Uh, but then getting the audio to remap is the slightly more tricky part. But yeah, let's switch to NAT and see if we, we at least get some IP addresses, get them on the network. 
I, maybe that's my problem as well. Let's do it here. Okay. If you hate someone, you can get some really you can get really nasty with music on hold. Uh, Asterix supports multiple music on hold classes, and a class for music on hold is basically a selection of your favorite tunes to play to a caller at various times. Another legal notice. You are not legally allowed to share your MP3 connection to callers who are waiting on hold on your phone system. You need an APRA broadcast license for that. You are also not allowed to stream radio stations to your callers. You need an APRA broadcast license for that. If it's an Australian radio station. If it's not an Australian radio station, if you're streaming from the intertubes a radio station, you can actually reuse that stream as music on hold, but it takes up a lot of your bandwidth. Your asterisk box is then continuously streaming this radio stream at about 8 to 16 to 24K, depending on which stream you pick. And all of that is then no longer available to your IP calls. Um, Asterix, uh, or free PBX ships with about three sample um, MP3s that are used for music on hold. They're delightful <laughs> and great fun at parties. Uh, you can, if you do a search, uh, search basically for royalty-free music. There is actually quite a nice supply of, of fairly good, fairly innocuous classical music that one can use uh, for hold music. Or break the law. I mean, that's your choice too. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, that's also an option. Okay. Outbound, outbound CID. Uh, in Australia, you're, uh, I'm going to say this a lot there, you're not legally allowed to change your CID or caller, identifier, uh, caller ID to something you don't own. Um, outbound caller ID, however, will allow you to, uh, on Australian ISDN services, change, by default, it'll use the DID. So the number you use to call in, if I phone out, it'll use the same number. But what a lot of corporates don't like is they don't want their direct numbers actually being sent out as caller ID when their users make a phone call. So override the caller ID, you could put your main number in there, which means anybody makes a call, it uses the main caller ID instead of using the individual direct caller ID. Okay. Do I want call waiting? Should the phone actually support multiple calls to a single phone? How long do I want the ring time? These are fairly obvious kind of options there. The secret. There has been a spate of Asterix hacks recently where people are running, getting run up $100,000 Telstra bills because they use the same extension number as their secret. Extension 102, secret 102. Okay, it's very easy to do and it makes configuring your phones really easy. I will, there is a pro to it. The downside is that there are a lot of um, hacks going on that are looking for open SIP ports and then attempting to register with a series of numbers with the same number and, uh, as the name, the uh, extension number and the secret. You'd be surprised how often this works. So I suggest some form of obfuscation. So I'll reverse the number. That'll trick them. Okay. Fax handling. Asterix's built-in fax handling is shit. Okay. If you're going to do serious faxing, by serious faxing I mean more than about one an hour, uh, you want to probably link your Asterix box to Hylofax, which is an open source fax server. There is a mag wonderful piece of software called IAX Modem. An IAX Modem is a bridge between Asterix and Hylofax. It looks like a modem to Hylofax. It looks like an IAX extension to Asterix. Okay, so if you're going to run uh, IAX, uh, Hylofax and Asterix, put your IAX modem on the machine with Hylofax. Okay, it's a modem. It needs, uh, sorry, other way around, on the machine with Asterix. It needs the fastest possible bandwidth between uh, Asterix and the modem itself. It then actually just talks at 9600 board, or 144 if you've got an extra super fast fax, back to the Hylofax server. So the speed between the IAX modem itself and Hylofax doesn't need to be that high. It's, you know, whatever the speed of a normal fax transmission is, 9600 board. But the comes to get quality on the line is between IAX and Asterix itself. If you try doing this over VoIP, it's going to work often enough for you to think it's stable, and then it's going to fail just when you get your mortgage approval fax to you. Okay? 
So fax over VoIP, again, is possible if you do one fax every you know, three or four days, just to give it time to prep. But it's not really designed. It's certainly, if you do want to try fax over VoIP, you cannot use a compression codec. You have to use ALOR. In Australia, ALOR is the default for our digital lines. So switch over, use ISDN, use ALOR, or use ALOR to your IP provider and hope they don't use compression upstream. Anything that uses compression on that line will break your fax. Okay. The nice thing is, with Trixbox, they actually incorporate two fax detections. Zaptel detection only works on hardware connections to the PSTN. So Zaptel devices, Digium devices, Sangoma devices, it will do fax detection on them. Okay? Which means it only works here if the call this extension is receiving is coming in via a Zaptel device. If, however, you've got a... Uh, a device that actually plugs into your phone system that's separate from Asterix, the call will come in over SIP. It'll come in over an IP connection. At that point, you can switch over to NVFAX. NVFAX is a fax detection uh, drive that actually will detect faxes on any channel that Asterix supports. Okay, which is, it's uh, far more reliable, but it takes longer. Okay, so one of the things, once you turn on fax detection, in Australia, we have the Absolutely lovely STD beeps. If you don't have at least four seconds, the STD beeps make Asterix think it's a fax. Or it triggers the, the hang-up detection. You hit an STD beep and Asterix hangs up. So you need about four seconds and understand now I'm doing fax detection, which means I'm going to answer every single call, regardless of the person being called is there or not. So this will charge your customers money. As soon as your, the phone line starts ringing, Asterix answers and waits to see if it's a fax. If it's not, it then starts ringing the extension. If you don't have fax detection, Asterix doesn't actually answer the line until the extension or destination that you're routing to has answered the channel. Okay. So if you turn on fax detection, it is actually going to answer every single call that gets routed to this extension. So I'm going to turn it off. Privacy Manager is awesome for saving money here in Australia because inbound caller ID costs you $6 a month on most Telstra connections. Privacy Manager says if there's no caller ID, a lovely voice is going to say, I'm sorry, this caller does not accept unidentified calls. Please enter your full 10 digit phone number and then the pound key. <laughs> so if you get calls without caller ID, it will force the caller to input caller ID before it actually continues to route the call. So then you get caller ID on your phones, which is really cool. And it actually stops a lot of marketing people. Like, I'm on the do not call list, but that doesn't seem to have a big impact. Um, but actually having to make an effort to get to talk to me uh, seems to be a bit too much for them. So that's quite good. Uh, dictation. <coughs> uh, the dictation service is one of those additional modules that you can download. I don't think it's installed by default. Uh, <coughs> if you download it, you can turn on dictation, select either OG or MP3, I think, or OG or WAV. OG, GSM or WAV, you phone up code on your phone, you talk to your phone, you hang up, and it emails what you said to you. Okay, so a fairly cheap dictation service built in. A language code, how to piss off your coworkers really quickly. Uh, any language code fires off Asterix's internal translation. So if you have sound files in that language code, it will start using those sound files instead of the default, which is English on Trixbox. Okay. You do have, Trixbox only ships with the English uh, sound files, so you have to go onto the internet, find sound files for a different language, install those on your box, and then it will switch to an additional language. I actually have two languages uh, on this box. I have an American and Australian. Uh, the American is the default Asterix voice, whose name's Allison. I'm told he's a lovely person. The Australian is a guy uh, that we, that, uh, openvoice.com.au, a great set of prepackaged Asterix prompts uh, uh, in Australian dialect using p um, hash instead of pound, for example, for all of the prompts. And you actually can buy a pack of Trixbox recordings that replace all of the Trixbox recordings in a single dump. And it's also available for children's parties and to record your own messages. Okay. 
Record incoming and outgoing. Reminder that you're not legally allowed to do this without permission, so I leave it on on demand, which means a user can dial star one in the middle of a call, and it will start the call being recorded by Asterix. You can, however, do the lovely, your call will be recorded for quality and testing purposes. The call is automatically recorded, and then if the user wants the call not to be recorded, about the easiest way is to tell your uh, users to hang up and phone them back. Has, has anybody ever said, no, I don't want my call to be recorded, by the way? Because a lot of people, that I know that the phone system's not actually designed to not record incoming calls. So a lot of the places when you say that, they actually have to hang up and phone you back. Because they don't record outgoing calls, but they record every ingoing, incoming call regardless. You know, over a couple of calls, things that have been actually displayed, do not listen to this file, but it's still recorded. Yes, there, there, there's an, another option, yes. Yes. Option. Lastly, voicemail. Uh, you may not want voicemail in every extension. Some extensions are going to be for users, so you want voicemail on those. Other extensions are going to be for devices on your network that, uh, you know, if you plug a fax machine into one of these things, your fax machine does not need voicemail, for example. Voicemail password. Voicemail passwords should always be numeric because it's really difficult to type. <laughs> when, you, when, you're, when you're phoning voicemail from your phone, it's really difficult to type letters on a keypad. So numeric password. Uh, email address for sending of voicemail or page addresses sends a smaller message. Uh, a couple of options. Do you want me to actually, or do you want uh, your Asterix box to email you the voicemail itself? So you get notification of a voicemail, I can actually attach, well Asterix, I'm not going to, I'm not in your server attaching voicemail. Asterix will attach your voicemail uh, in WAV format. Okay, In whatever codec you receive the call on. So if you do translational codecs and you go, you switch it into GSM or something like that, you need a codec that plays GSM on the machine you're going to play your WAV file in. Okay. Play the on, uh, play CID. Do you want to play? Uh, is the date and time that the call was received? VM options. These are additional options that get sent uh, when you pipe to voicemail. Uh, advanced configuration, you then have to go into the asterisk manual to look at additional voicemail options. I've never used it. Okay, I find the default ones really good. The new stuff down at the bottom is VMX Locator. This gives each voicemail box the equivalent of a mini IVR. So your users in their portal get the option of providing additional numbers if a user presses 0, 1, or 2. So then they can record a message going, hi, this is Avi, I'm not here, press 1 to get me on my mobile, or press 2 to go back to the operator. I think 0 is by default the operator, press 1 to get me on my mobile. You don't have to say what numbers do, but you can then provide kind of a, a manual follow me, if you like, to people who do get your voicemail. In order for that to work, however, VMX has to be enabled for that voicemail box. So you turn it on, then the user can go into their web portal and configure the numbers that they want to see. So once I've added an extension, I hit Submit. You'll notice up in the top right-hand corner, I get the Apply Configurations bar. I can continue configuring additional extensions, trunks, routes, etc. Nothing's actually changed on the Asterix configuration until I apply the configuration. Okay. What's the emergency CID? Ah, emergency ID overwrites uh, a CID uh, for emergency calls only. So when we look at um, outbound routes, you get to flag a route as an emergency route. At that point, instead of using the default CID, it will use an emergency CID. It's also good if you don't override the CID for normal calls, but you actually want your main number, which is in the white pages, to get used as the emergency CID, it's more likely to be associated with address information. Okay. Twixbox's default emergency call handling is, is pretty ordinary. Uh, there are a number of lovely scripts online that will actually do soft hang-ups. So if somebody dials triple zero and there's no available line, it will actually soft hang up the first line and then dial triple zero. So you're kind of assured that your PBX, you're not, if everybody's in a call and you're trying to dial triple zero, you'll get a line. It's also a good idea to have a uh, analog connected phone somewhere for triple zero. VoIP is still a bit iffy about where triple zero really terminates. Uh, and I have heard stories of police showing up at uh, ISP's uh, data centers 
because that's where the vote, the dial-out vote number actually terminated. So that's where they thought the call was coming from. Um, you should, should always tell what, uh, which city in which town you're in. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't say Hobart, then um, yeah. there's something you want to turn up in Sydney somewhere. Yeah. This is, of course, assuming you're able to talk. Or someone else to talk to, whatever, but always yeah. mention which. Also, awesome. a little known fact, by the way, if you're, not, if, you, if you're not able to talk, you are able to text triple zero now. Yep. Okay. Okay. So it's best to pass through if you can follow the, the, the real number. Yeah. So the forward is the room for validated and that's what's in the integrated direction. Okay, cool. Good to know. If I click apply, it has this floating box, continue with reload or not. Yes, let's continue with the reload. <coughs> No, and it doesn't interrupt any existing calls that are running on the ASICS box. It just reloads the configuration in the background, okay. which is really annoying. One of the things, that if, you, if you ever try to do a fairly invasive reconfiguration, there's always going to be some idiot who is sitting on his phone, and I just want to reboot. And uh, ASICS has a great, um, sh a great series of shutdown commands where you can do uh, shutdown when available, shutdown when convenient which means Asterix will stop any outbound calls from being made, but it won't terminate any existing calls. And it'll, as soon as it has no calls on the system, it then restarts Asterix or shuts down, depending on what your options are. So that's pretty nice. I, I used to get quite ruthless with some of my people. If I told them that I was bringing the Asterix boxes down at a particular time, I'd just cut off their calls. <laughs> okay, so I've set up my um, extension. I have a couple more, so let's uh, I'm just doing this I'm using an SSH channel because my ATA is on my uh, private network, which my Mac is not actually connected to. It's the only reason I'm using a, a tunnel for this. So that's the uh, Linksys user menu. You can see this uh, ATA is currently set up for Node Phone. Uh, I just ripped it out of my house. Um, it's not getting anywhere because the appliance doesn't route. So sadly, uh, you might notice that line one light hasn't come up yet. So it actually hasn't got a connection. Let's uh, reconfigure it. Handy. If you have a headless PBX to know what your <laughs> what your IP addresses are. Okay. All I need for asterisk is user ID and password. I don't use and we don't use auth IDs for asterisk separately. User ID and password is enough. What you want to do as well. All these service subscriptions, if you want to use Asterix's own services, call awaiting and stuff, just turn them all off. So all of the vertical service activations on, on external devices, you actually want to turn them off. Okay, they're designed to be working against a single IP or single uh, VoIP account, so they'll do it inside the box. Asterix does most of the stuff for you, so you can turn a bunch of the stuff off. Preferred codec, uh, Australia's standard digital codec is ALOR. The US is uh, Moolaw, so Greek Moolaw. Just to be difficult, you Americans. Okay. And they will otherwise um, 
negotiate a different codec. Uh, notice that it uses G729A, and there are various versions of G729. And if you install a different version of G729 on your Asterix box as a codec, then they won't talk to each other. Uh, G729 is a patented codec as well. You are meant to pay for it. Uh, however, it's not officially patented in Australia. So there's no patent burden here. You can download student versions and, and research versions of the G729 codec and use it without patent encumbrance in Australia only. You can't do it in America, for example. It is patent encumbered in America. I would recommend for, if you've got ISDN, use ALOR, because that's what ISDN uses. There's no transcoding between your phone and the uh, ISDN service, so Asterix does far less work. Um, if you are going to route calls on the internet, GSM. It's not patent incumbent. It has pretty good compression. It drops call rates to about, I think, 16 to 20K per call. So it's pretty light. Uh, ALOR, by the way, 64K. Okay, so it's a full, a fairly wide band. Yes, it's kilobits. Yes, thank you. <coughs> Annoying thing about these links is if you change the configuration, it reboots instantly. But you'll notice my line one has come up. And if I dial. Oops. I can hear it. You can't. So, calls are working. Okay. So, what FreeBBX has done with my extension configuration, and just by adding that extension, it's added all of the dial plan routes between the extensions on the appliance. So, the ability for 100 to call 102 and the ability for 102 to call 100 are automatically added. To give you an idea of what that looks like, Uh, no, dial plan additional. <laughs> this is the uh, dial plan, the main dial plan. Ah. There's a bunch of the uh, dial-in numbers. You can see a couple of my node phone uh, DIDs that I'm, that I'm writing in. There's a bunch of lines for each of those. There's the extension that we added. So just to support direct human dialing for the extension requires that. OK. And there's a whole bunch of macro stuff. So historically, we used to have to write all this stuff ourselves. Okay. You can. It's fun if you want to. Okay. If you are so inclined. Okay. So now we've got calls uh, going between two extensions. What we need to look at are the um, the ways of getting calls into and out of our servers. There are a couple of things that work together on this. There are trunks. Trunks are connections to other providers. So that can be another asterisk system. It can be another VoIP system. It can be uh, the PSTN. So uh, a trunk can be a configuration of ports on your server. For example, we'll start with trunks. And I will uh, take a look at the trunks that I've got. I've got ZAP3. So port 3 on my ZapTel card. I, could have, I only have one phone line at home, so I only configure a single port. Uh, I could do ZAP grouping. So inside your Zaptel configuration, you can say these ports are grouped together and then combine them as one trunk. So if you say, if you write a call to group zero of Zap, it'll pick an available line in that group. Really useful for ISDNs where you're dealing with 10, 20, 30 uh, incoming channels. And you can just deal with them as a group instead of trying to create uh, an individual Zap channel for each of your 30 connections. Okay, so I recommend it. You can see my two node phone. Um, my two node phone uh, SIP IP connections. And I actually set up a VMware pair to my uh, virtual machine a while ago. Um, so this was connecting to the Asterix box that I was prepping for a demo. Right. woo
Of course, do you think it's going to route into my VM now? Fought with peril. Okay. Uh, each Tron type uh, has different styles of configuration. So for a Zaptron, for example, I can set outbound caller ID, useful for ISDNs, where by default it, uh, I might use the extension DID. You can override it again here on the trunk. Uh, you can tell it never to override the caller ID. How many channels? Useful for uh, monitoring trunk capacity. If you set up an IP um, trunk, so a VoIP trunk, and you don't tell it how many channels it's got, it's just going to attempt to send calls to it if it's connected. Most sort of entry level I, uh, ISP VoIP connections only allow you about two outbound connections until you have to start paying more. So it's always useful to give it a, uh, a maximum channel count so that if you start doing uh, channel uh, cascading when we start routing, it knows, oh, I've already got two calls on that channel. I have to go to the next one immediately. OK. I can disable the trunk completely. Just really quickly hit the disable button, save. Asterix will then stop routing to that trunk and just automatically skip it. I can monitor trunk failures. So if, the, uh, if we uh, monitor the trunk and it fails, we can call a script. And you know you can do things like Nagios alerting with this. You can get Asterix to notify Nagios if one of its trunks goes down. Now we get to dial rules. Dial rules are everywhere here. And they all do slightly different things. Okay. Dial rules on the trunk means this is what the trunk is going to do when presented a number by the router. Okay. So when Asterix finally gets to the point of sending a call to this trunk, the dial rules for the trunk is going to determine what the trunk does with that number. Okay. So there are a number of things we can do. We can set up patterns for, um, it's quite a long explanation, we can set up patterns for numbers that are allowed. If you don't provide any dial rules, it'll accept any number and attempt to dial it on that trunk. If you set up rules, it'll only uh, accept calls that match one of your dial rules. Uh, X is any digit from 0 to 9. Z is any digit from 1 to 9. N is any digit from 2 to 9. So you can start creating patterns. If I wanted to only accept local calls, that'll do it. Don't only really accept something that starts with a 2, so nothing that starts 0. Uh, and it only accepts eight, uh, uh, 8 numbers, so a local call. It's probably the, mo not the most secure number, but it would work as a pattern. The fun things about dial rules is that you can play silly buggers with them. You can get asterisks to add and remove numbers from the dial plan at the trunk level. So your users don't need to know how to dial for various trunks. Back in the day when, when VoIP started getting really popular, each VoIP provider had or seemed to have a different style of requiring numbers to be delivered. Some said you have to provide all uh, 10 digits of every Australian number regardless if it was local to you or not. So for local calls, what we could do Yes. So if I add 03 plus, what that means is if I match a dial pattern uh, N, so the, the number 2 to 9, followed by 7 digits that are anything from 0 to 9, I will send 03 and the number to the trunk. So a user on the phone just dials their 8 digit number, the trunk goes and adds the 03 automatically because that's specific to this trunk. So some VoIP providers required that. Other VoIP providers required the full international number of that. So you would have to do something like 613. So add the full international dial code for it. No. No. Because the, the, the 00 uh, or 0011 is actually Telstra's prefix for it. Yeah. Yes. There are a bunch of dial plan wizards that I found uh, that I found are um, fairly US centric. Okay, seven digit and ten digit numbers, for example, dialing with a prefix, removing a prefix. The only thing that I really use dial plans for in the trunk, because we'll see dial plans again in outbound routes. 
which I find them far more useful in outbound routes. In trunks, what I usually do is get them to add prefixes that might be needed by a particular trunk or remove numbers. <coughs> there was one ISP, that I can't remember exactly, didn't want the zero. So they would accept a local number, but if you dialed an STD number, they wanted you to drop the zero from the front. Oops. So there, if you pass in 0x, nxxx, xxxx, x, 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 x uh, what uh, Asterix will do is it'll drop the leading zero. Okay. Some more fun and games. If somebody dials double zero, double one, and an international number, I'm going to do the plus six one. Uh, the, it's, it's slightly wrong, but uh, the, the, the spirit is there. If not, the, that's not going to work. But essentially, you can drop numbers and add them at the same time. So you can have numbers piped plus numbers. It'll drop the leading numbers and then add the numbers after the plus. So you can actually manipulate your numbering quite nicely. And this is useful if you have multiple trunks, each with a different numbering plan. It's the only reason why you do dial plans inside the trunk. Usually we do dial plans inside the outbound routes. So I'm going to erase this. The nice thing is with, um, with Node Phone, I've, I've noticed that it accepts almost any numbering plan. You can dial local numbers to wherever your Node Phone is associated with. So when you, when you set up Node Phone, it asks you what city in Australia you want to be associated with. And when you dial eight digits, it dials that city or that um, prefix, 0304 kind of thing. Uh, and then it accepts kind of all the permutations of international dial codes as well. Look at the Node Phone. This is a SIP trunk. So in the ZAP one, we just had... A, uh, a channel ID, so it could be three, it could be G0 for group zero. You can, uh, once you get into ISDN services, you can actually create uh, channel groups. So I've got 30 channels. I'll create group zero, which is channels uh, zero to nine. Group one is 10 to 16. Group three is these. These are all my fax lines, and I'll auto-route those off onto fax machines or uh, virtual fax machines. You can have some quite nice fun with uh, Zaptil routing. Uh, this is a SIP trunk. You can configure it in two ways. The default Trixbox configuration is with a dual uh, peer and user. Peer is a person I send calls to. A user is something I receive calls from. So you can actually set up SIP uh, trunks that you can only make calls to and you cannot receive calls on or vice versa that you can receive calls on but you can never make calls to just by choosing which of the two you use. However, uh, I'm again being a silly bugger because you'll notice at the top of the first thing that I say is type equals friend. And a friend is always both a peer and a user at the same time. So it's a single configuration block for both peer and user in one block. If you want to know the settings for your ISP, there's this lovely tool called Google because they're all different. And the configuration that works for Node Phone 1, by the way, doesn't work for Node Phone 2 or didn't in my case, they might have fixed that. I did complain to somebody from Internode on Sunday when I met him. Um, and they changed from time to time as the ISPs upgraded. So when I first did this to Node Phone, when they first came out like a year or so ago, when they did Node Phone 1, the configuration block that I had for that, I cut and paste, I store everything in SVN, I'm an SVN hall. So I had all my configuration of Masterix and SVN, ripped it out of SVN, pasted it in, didn't connect. Yay. So I had to do the Google thing and find out that that now works. So that sets up a SIP trunk. An IOX trunk looks fairly similar, but also has uh, uh, peer and user details. The nice thing about IOX, it supports RSA authentication. So in this case, I actually set up public key authentication between my two IOX boxes. 
So I've got uh, private keys on each asterisk box, shared the public keys between the two, and it will use those keys for authentication when setting up an IAX2 trunk. Now that my uh, VM is up, that's what I'm going to show you uh, when I set up the trunking. Okay. So let's see if I can. Yay. Well, I was going to show it to you, but even though my VM is up, it, uh, <laughs> Pardon me? No, it's, it's uh, Trixbox. Trixbox sits on port 80, so it, it wouldn't be a different port, but... Um, Thank you, kids. Okay, so let's... Uh, Uh, Asterix's keys by default are stored in Vilib Asterix keys. Uh, Trixbox doesn't have any GUI interface for creating the keys that are used for uh, RSA authentication of, of IAX2 trunks. So what I'm going to do, once I wait for, come on. Gen key minus n. The minus n is for no password. The reason for no password on the key is you don't want to have to type a password to restart your PBX. Like uh, Apache, you can assign a password into the, the SSL keys that you use for Apache, but if you do and you're not there when Apache reboots, you have, the Apache doesn't start until the password is given. Okay. You don't have to pro provide an extension. It'll automatically create the .key and the .pub files for you. There you go. I now have my uh, key for this server. It won't allow you to delete trunks that are in use by a route. Okay. Because what it does by default set up a default zap group and a default outbound route for nine and anything. So it won't allow you to delete that until you delete the outbound route. So let's create a new trunk. I mean, but basically what I'm doing is setting up a connection between the asterisk box running on my virtual machine and the appliance itself. I do this through the coming use of cut and paste. And there is something that I want to point out, and this is what got me when I was setting up these trunks in the first time. They're reversed. The naming, if you look, the name of the peer is VMware peer. It's the remote server dash peer. And I talk about the username is appliance user is the local user. So when the VMware peer accepts a call, it's going to expect it to come from appliance user. I'm an appliance. My username is appliance user. I'm going to connect to the VMware peer. I'm making an outbound call. And I'm going to authenticate myself as appliance user. Inbound, when I get a call from a user called VMware user, these are the settings that I'm going to use for that. And I'm going to expect those calls to come in from a particular IP address. So what I need to do on my uh, VMware server, so take it through. The appliance peer, so when I make a call to the appliance peer, I'm going to use the username VMware user. I'm going to, I'm a type of peer, so I'm an outbound connection. I set trunk equals yes. 
Trunk equals yes is great for when you have multiple concurrent calls over a single IAX2 trunk. It actually merges the media. Okay, so it's far more efficient bandwidth utilization. Qualify equals yes means Asterix will continuously monitor the latency of that uh, connection, and if it goes over a preset amount, it will flag the connection as down. By default, a qualify equals yes is 200 milliseconds, I think, from memory. Uh, you can put a number in there. So you can say qualify equals 400, which means it'll do a qualify every 400. It'll wait for a 400 millisecond latency. The host that I'm connecting to, don't use DNS names, because Asterix has a whopping great big DNS bug. <laughs> and still does in the 1.4 version. If DNS is not up, when it attempts to do the initial connection to these trunks, it will never try a DNS request again until it's restarted. Ever. So use IP addresses if you can possibly help it. Disallow all other codecs except for allow a law, which means a way of restricting codec use on this trunk to a particular codec. You can do uh, multiple codecs with multiple allow lines. So this way I can allow both ALO and GSM. And lastly, my authentication type is RSA, which means I'll use the key authentication. You could use not to. You can use the same SIP username and password style authentication if you want to, but that does get sent completely clear on, uh, on the wire. So if you're doing IAX2 trunking over the internet, <laughs> I strongly recommend you switch back to, or switch to using RSA uh, encryption, or RSA authentication, validation, verification. <laughs> So again, this is the incoming settings. The user is called appliance user. So I'm an expected call from something identifying itself as appliance user. The context is quite important because it dictates how the calls handle. If this is an internal trunk, i.e. it's a call from another one of my own asterisk boxes, I want it to come from, from internal because I want people to be able to dial extensions directly and to use the internal features that might be on this uh, PBX. If it's not, if it's a, uh, a VoIP connection from your ISP that's coming in over IAX, it should be from trunk, okay? Or from external, I think, works nowadays as well. That way it gets routed in the same way an analog or ISDN call would be. So it only will support the routes that incoming calls from external uh, styles uh, or external destinations would work. So from internal and from external are great. Uh, for managing what kind of access these incoming calls would have inside your PBX. Again, another one of the ways that people are making $100,000 phone bills happen is incorrect uh, determination of where incoming calls hit when they get to your asterisk box. You have an external, you actually have an external trunk, but you say from internal means that I can start dialing out. If I can get a dial tone on your PBX, I can start dialing out any kind of number. Click save and reload. <clears throat> and down here is my appliance peer. For some reason currently unreachable. It could be because I haven't shared my keys yet. Okay, so the two trunks are not able to authenticate with one another. Could also be because I'm not doing NAT into these things.
Switch to network I control. <laughs> it should be easier. Two four four, that's better. Notice now that the uh, appliance pair has come online. So I can now see I've got a 21 millisecond latency. Uh, it's still going to allow me to make calls because I haven't actually shared uh, my public key. So when I actually try to start up a call to that trunk, it's going to fail in mysteriously unlogged kind of ways. Um, but at this point, there is no way for me to actually call between the boxes. Okay, I've got this trunk but there's no way for me to pick up a phone and start dialing an extension on the other, um, the other asterisk box. There are two ways of setting this up. I'm just going to add myself an extension to my virtual box. So I've got something to call. Okay, so extensions. Stupid place for a delete button. Okay, so now I have an extension on uh, my laptop. If I dial star 43, which is the... Try to dial star 43. I should get... Echo test, star 43, great way of seeing how fast you get to your uh, end user. But it's a nice way also of testing that Asterix is listening. Okay, So now I have somebody to phone. But if I try to dial 100, which is the extension. Your call cannot be completed as dialed. Please check the number and dial again. Sadly, checking the number and dialing again is not going to make it work. What I need is an outbound route. I need to tell Asterix if I dial a particular pattern which, uh, or where to send it because the trunk is not local. So for this, I want to send all 1xx extensions to the appliance. So now I have a route that says if the number is 1xx, that's what it matches, send it to the appliance pair. This is still going to fail. Anybody remember why? No keys. Cool.
No, not front row, go away. <laughs> Okay, uh, asterisk minus R connects to the running asterisk console. Uh, what I've done is added those public keys, but I need to tell asterisk that they're there. If I do a key show, you'll notice that it only lists the two that ship by default with asterisk. It doesn't even show its own. Do a module reload res crypto, and it will then load in the keys that I've just added. <clears throat> so I now I have a private key, which is my own, the public key for the appliance, and the public key for myself. So you can see the appliance already had its own key. I didn't recreate them, but I just loaded up the VMware one. So now, with any luck, with five minutes to go, yay! <laughs> it is quite fun if you're really bored, by the way, and you want a good boss screen just to have the SSH console of your running asterisk box, just watching calls. It's very zen. It's the equivalent now, I think, for what used to be a defrag back in the days when you had to defrag. Ah, I can't do anything now. I'm defragging hours it's going to take. It's critical to solving this problem. Okay. There are two ways to do that kind of routing between extensions. When I started with Squiz's network, we had uh, three asterisk boxes, so we had extensions, so three extension ranges. It was really easy to create three uh, outbound routes on each server. But by the time I finished, we had about nine or ten asterisk boxes in different countries, getting far more difficult to do um, outbound routes. It's tedious to recreate all of these routes on each server. So I actually flipped from using uh, static routing, which is in here, to actually using Dundee. And Dundee is the routing equivalent of DNS, essentially, in a way vaguely, as a bad analogy. What it does is it allows you to set up on each server what numbers it handles uh, internally on the box, i.e. its extensions, what numbers it is connected to on the PSDN, so what is local calls on the PSDN, and what uh, priority to assign to that. And then what you do is you set up Dundee peers, so one configuration, I say on each server, these are the other Dundee servers, much, much simpler. And they do internal routing. They say, I dial an extension, it will find the server that handles that extension pattern through Dundee and then route the call to it. What I was going to get to, had I still been at Squiz, is the ability to move your extension with you. So when you get down to Melbourne, you type in your extension number and it then starts routing your calls to an extension in Melbourne. So the servers know which extension you are registered to. So that's kind of the stuff you can do. Um, I was hoping to be far more ahead on this. I just want to do inbound routes because this only allows me to make uh, or to receive calls, or make calls, sorry, outbound. Inbound is quite important. If you don't have an inbound route, you're not going to get any calls from the outside world. You'll notice that I did get a <coughs> an internal trunk call, but I didn't get any outside. Particularly useful for ISDN and PSTN. If you don't have anything, people will ring your number. Asterix will answer and say, your call cannot be completed as dialed and hang up on them. Okay, so you have to do uh, some form of in, uh, inbound routing. The way they do it nowadays is if you have uh, analog cards, there's no presentation of caller ID um, automatically. So they do a, a matching uh, with uh, Zap channels. You tell it, for this channel, this is the DID that I want you to assume it is, because an analog channel has one number, usually. You say, okay, so channel three is this number. You can then use that number as the call ID in your inbound route. So I can say, for my inbound route, here's one I prepared earlier. My node phone two number. So the inbound call, the DID, the number that you call is your node phone number, for example. What do you want to do? Again, I've got fax handling, so I can do it on the inbound route. 
Really useful if you have dedicated fax numbers, by the way. Don't do any fax detection. If it's a fax number, send it to your fax machine. Don't have to do that tedious fax detection at that point. And down at the bottom, you can set your destination. As you start adding things to asterisks, you will start getting more and more destinations here. So things that I haven't actually managed to discuss, a ring group is just a collection of phones. Instead of dialing an extension directly, you create a ring group, and that is a set of phones. That can be both internal extensions and external numbers. So you can get your internal phones and your mobile to ring at once. There are a bunch of options. Uh, get into the directory, terminate the call, just hang up. This is great if you have somebody you don't like. Instead of putting in a DID number, you put in a caller ID number. So if you get a phone call from that person, it just immediately hangs up. Okay. So with any luck with this inbound route on my node phone, it gets sent to the ring group. If I have coverage. So there's, that's the node phone call coming in from my mobile. Hello. Cool. And has audio. Uh, yeah. Basic asterisks, that'll get, at least get you up and running, having extensions and making calls. So, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Question? They still actually, they, they present, uh, a lot of international numbers I know actually do present a caller ID of blocked. Yeah. So, which is a caller ID, it's quite interesting. It's not seen as null. Yeah. So, uh, so there's some ones that are legitimately uh, blocked. Mm. Yeah. And my guess is that Asterix is probably still going to prompt them for their number. Yeah. yeah. And they can still send their number if they follow that prompt. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's a nice manual replacement because it doesn't rely on any caller ID service. It assumes none. Yeah. Yeah. Pardon me? Yep. Yes. Absolutely, there's the most amazing resource actually, thank you for reminding me. Um, it used to be written for Trixbox, now it's actually written for Elastix, it's called Elastix Without Tears. Uh, written by a guy who I actually tried to convince to do this presentation instead of me. <laughs> but he was, I, was, I was trying to motivate him to do it. Um, ben Sharif wrote it right in the beginning of the days of uh, Asterix at Home, and he started this Asterix at Home Without Tears. And it's being developed, it's like 260 pages long. Okay, and it has all the configuration details. Um, and most of the ISP configurations, however, seem to be out of date now. I don't know the last time you updated those. So I usually use Whirlpool's VoIP forum. So if you have an ISP or a VoIP provider that's not playing ball, the VoIP forum on Whirlpool tends to have the most recent uh, Asterix configuration blocks. And if you start playing with Asterix 1.6, however, the configs have changed again. So those blocks that work for 1.4 tend not to work for 1.6. I haven't been game enough to try loading 1.6 yet. It's not two years old, which is, seems to be the right amount of maturity for Asterix to hit a fairly stable platform. Again, because the phones are phones, they're the kind of things that you want to have them in test for you know, a good six to nine months of being hammered before you put them in production. So I haven't actually even managed to play with 1.6 yet. Yep, so thank you very much, guys. I'm a I'll be out there if you have more questions.